Welcome back to our new small group series, The Parables of Jesus. Today we talk about the parable of the mustard seed. And now for our favorite speaker, Pastor Sadler. So welcome today to our second lesson or second parable in our series on uh, the parables of Jesus. Today we're going to be looking at the mustard seed and it is found in Matthew 13 verses 31 and 32. And it is a very small parable, but I think it's going to uh, be a, a fundamental lesson for application of kingdom matters. And so get started today. Let's look at the power of a parable. I've uh, been doing a little research on uh, neurology or neurosciences. And uh, if you don't know, neurology is a branch of medicine that deals mostly with the brain and spinal column and all the nerves, uh, peripheral nerves in your body that are connected. And so neuroscience through scans like uh, PET scans, ultrasounds, MRIs, have been able to determine that when an individual is speaking, it's one particular part of their brain uh, where the origin of the information is coming. And so if I'm talking to you and I'm disseminating information to you, a bunch of details and data, that there's a particular part of my brain that that is coming from. But then you as the hearer, uh, you're receiving it. It's a different part of your brain that's taking in this information. And that is important because the part of your brain that is receiving it is in a more short-term memory or retention part of the brain, but the part of the brain that I'm using to tell you the information comes from my long-term memory, maybe something I committed to memory uh, many years ago or through personal experience, it was very important to me. And so what neuroscience has discovered that I as the speaker telling the information or the data to you, if I put it in a story, it engages the long-term memory part of your brain instead of the short-term memory part of your brain. And, and so that fact has been validated by additional research saying that when that information was shared in a story, you retained over 65% of the information three days later. But when an individual like me shares information or data with you as the hearer, that you retain less than 10% three days later. So you can see the effective benefit of storytelling. And, and I really believe that Jesus understood the power of stories. And so in a little bit of review, what is a parable? A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And then uh, a little more review, Jesus used parables, number one, to fulfill prophecies about the Messiah. The Old Testament prophets established that the Messiah would come and use the, the method of parables. And so Jesus fulfilled that. Secondly, uh, we know through our previous study that Jesus used parables uh, to disguise information. There were religious leaders, scribes, you know, they didn't have uh, copy machines. And so the scribes was an individual, a person uh, literally wrote copies of uh, Old Testament law and prophets. And so if your everyday job was writing the same passage of scripture, uh, you would tend to feel like an expert or you would have retained X amount of knowledge or information. And so they became very puffed up, elevated their mind. And the Pharisees were supposedly masters of the law. But, you know, Jesus expounded in another passage that you strain at a gnat and you swallow a camel. In other words, you unevenly apply the law based based on your own desired outcome. And so Jesus tells those that would be his followers or his disciples, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall not enter the kingdom of God. And so we understand Jesus used parables, stories about the kingdom of God and how it operates 
that it may be masked or hidden from those whose hearts were not right. We must come to God with the right spirit and the right attitude. So today we're looking at the uh, mustard seed. And for me personally, when I think of mustard seeds, I think of mustard and mustard's not my favorite condiment, but I do know that it has some medicinal purposes and people do, uh, some people do care for it. Uh, it's not the worst thing in the world. It's not my most favorite thing. But in Jesus's day, that uh, the mustard or mustard seed uh, would have been a very common thing. And so here we are again. Last week, Jesus is using an agrarian example about the four types of soil. And within the four types of soil, we determine we've got to decide which one we are. And so once again, here's Jesus using something that, that's very common, very ordinary. And uh, some people take issue that, you know, that things of heaven are extraordinary. Why is he using something so ordinary? Well, in the session coming here, we're going we're gonna to look at that in greater detail. Uh, this particular parable is one that some that want to take issue or exception with Jesus's parable here, the mustard seed. And they are, the issues they take is when Jesus says the mustard seed is the smallest of all the seeds. Well, in, in scientific community, it is not. Uh, the smallest of all seeds. Uh, the orchid seed is smaller. The cypress seed is smaller. There are other seeds that are smaller. And so they say, well, this must not be a true saying or Jesus must not be a real prophet of God because he misspoke. In their day, uh, there was uh, somewhat of a synonymous uh, between a mustard seed and small things. It was just identified as a small thing. If you see a small person, this is maybe not politically correct, but you may call them a shrimp. Well, let me ask a question. Is a shrimp the smallest thing in the sea? And we would automatically know it is not the smallest thing in the sea. But in our modern culture, the term shrimp has become synonymous with something that is small. And in Jesus' day, the mustard seed had become synonymous with something that's very small. And so he uses what is common or ordinary in their culture. And he says, you know, the mustard seed, the smallest of all seeds, it's, it's a shrimp, if you will. And then theologians also take issue that Jesus says that this mustard seed grows into a mighty tree. And by certain definitions, we wouldn't say a mustard plant is a tree, but you've got to go back and look at one of the manifestations or examples of what a tree was, that it would hold a bird. Jesus is saying not that it would become a tree with a trunk and bark like we think of a pine tree or an oak tree, but that it would become such a stout structure that it'd be able to sustain a large amount of weight. So if you you know, have already been asleep or you're getting sleepy or think you might go to sleep, if you want to get the crux, the main part of what this short two verse parable found in Matthew 13 is about, the key is, and the major point about this parable is that the mustard seed, it's not that it's the smallest literally, and it's not that it becomes a tree literally. It is that through the comparison of how it starts and then what it becomes, it's such a small thing. Jesus is trying to demonstrate the potential for growth. In other words, for something that seems so insignificant in its origin that it could grow to be something so substantial. A, a friend of mine showed me recently how he'd been to the Holy Lands and he was on the banks of the Sea of Galilee. And I asked him, what's that yellow green grass on the banks, covering the banks of the Sea of Galilee? And he said, man, those are mustard plants. And he says, if you were to slip in the water, you could reach up and grab one of those mustard plants. They can, you know, you can just hoist yourself right out. The, the, the seaside is just covered with them. So in Jesus' day, uh, they already understood how little bitty seeds such as a mustard seed could become a very substantial plant, even able to bear the weight of a man pulling himself out of the water. And so today, if I was to give you a, a modern quote, it would be, uh, do not despise small beginnings. Jesus is speaking to a people that may be evaluating, should we get on the Jesus train? Should we participate in this kingdom uh, that he's talking about? And if we're not careful, uh, we do have a tendency to dismiss things that we see as inferior, small, or insignificant.
Uh, you may not realize what the Apple Corporation or Microsoft and even now Amazon have in common, but all three of these powerhouse companies that are leaders in their industry, that have some of the greatest amounts of annual income, they all three started in a garage with very little cash and almost no employees. But over time, they have become world-changing entities with phenomenal uh, gross income, wealth, and prosperity for all of those that are connected. So we can understand, you know, oftentimes we call it the American dream, that you can go from rags to riches. And Jesus is trying to dial his disciples in to the potential that what starts out small, don't, don't despise it because it seems small or minor or insignificant, but evaluate what that mustard plant becomes. It becomes an overwhelming plant that you may not realize this, that you could tell long before you got to the mustard plant that you're near a mustard plant because it emits a, a strong pungent odor and that it is visible by its bright colors from a far distance and that even birds do build their nest in the top of it, six, seven, eight feet off the ground, able to bear a lot of weight. So it started out so small, but it's become so great. Do any of us shop for the holidays anymore that we don't use Amazon. Are any of us uh, unfamiliar with Microsoft or Apple? I think all of us know these, these companies, but at one time they were very obscure, unheard of organizations. Now, the general interpretation that I want to give you for this passage, and I think this will help us as Christ followers, if you're looking for an interpretation of these two verses, it would have to be that Jesus is speaking directly to those that might follow him. He senses their worry and concern. Uh, they're onlookers, they're, they're weighing their options, they're evaluating should we, you know, toss our hat into the ring of this uh, kingdom that Jesus talks about, or should we stay on the sidelines and look for another? And all they really knew was that the Roman uh, government occupied their country. They had a tyrannical reign. They had invaded them. They taxed them. And that uh, they were looking for a Messiah prophesied in the Old Testament that would come and deliver them. I, I imagine they were looking for a regal king, somebody with a mighty army, someone who showed great potential and promise. But think about it. Jesus had very humble beginnings in a manger. He was a carpenter's son, had little connections, had very few followers. Could he really be representing the Messiah and the kingdom of God? Uh, you know uh, this parable is found in all three of the synoptic gospels. You may say, well, Pastor, what's the synoptic gospel? The, it is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and they are uh, parallel accounts of Jesus' earthly ministry. They saw the same things, but they have a little different perspective. And so there's some understanding that if all three gospels recorded this, it must imply it is a fundamental or important teaching regarding the kingdom of God. And it is a illustration that we should hang on to that when we lose focus of what the kingdom of God is, we can remember uh, this parable of Jesus. Uh, let me ask you a question. Have you ever had a story that you just love to tell or maybe an illustration you enjoyed giving over and over again or a metaphor or a riddle that you like to stump people with. Have you ever used it more than once? Uh, maybe you're trying to teach people and then you have another group of people and you're trying to teach them and so you dig back to something you've used before because it worked so well in the past. Well, I'll tell you, uh, to be honest here, uh, I have some illustrations or some uh, teaching subjects that when asked to teach or give an illustration, I go back to those because I, I see them as fundamental. I think they teach a great lesson and I've somewhat mastered how to use them to get maximum effect or benefit from them. Uh, I literally believe that Jesus, more than likely, we never really consider this, but Jesus may have taught the same message or lesson or taught the same parable more than one time. If the parable of the mustard seed uh, 
is so uh, seminal to the fundamental doctrine of the kingdom that we don't despise small beginnings, that we by faith accept the, in obedience what Jesus is telling us to do, and that over time what seemed insignificant becomes a great and mighty kingdom of God. Uh, that he taught this to more than one group of people. And by hearing the same message more than one time, it's, it's very plausible that Jesus, you know, maybe emphasized or modified different aspects of the same truth or parable, depending on who he's talking to, their geography, their culture, the, the context of the moment. Uh, he may have emphasized aspects differently each time he taught the same parable. And so we need to be cognizant that maybe Luke uh, lifted out what Jesus said at one time and Matthew another. There are no uh, contradictions, but the emphases are a little different. Just remember that the parable of the mustard seed is beneficial for us to remember we cannot despise small beginnings. Um, let us also define the kingdom of God uh, that particular phrase, kingdom of God, is used by Jesus over 50 times in the book of Matthew alone. And if we're not careful, we'll gloss over that and not realize exactly what's being said. If you look back and think of the book of Genesis, you'll remember that God created man and put him in the garden. It was a place of peace and paradise for his people to inhabit. But then we know that Lucifer beguiled Eve, Adam also ate and sin separated them from the place of peace known as paradise and from a relationship with God. And so it brought about despair. It drove them from the paradise. It created chaos. Uh, it gave evil a voice. Now, I've never really thought about that till recently. Before the fall of man, as we call it, uh, the only voice they heard was the voice of God, and they walked with him in the cool of the day. But when Eve stopped and listened to Lucifer, from then on, sin has a voice. Paul talks about the things I know I should do, I do not, and that that I know I should not do, that I do. In other words, there is a war of voices that affect the decisions we make. But when we come in the kingdom, it is where peace has been restored, paradise has been reestablished, and uh, Jesus Christ himself will reign forevermore. And he is the voice that we listen to. Jesus told parables or stories to help his followers retain consistently be reminded of the facts about the kingdom of God. Example, in last week's parable of four uh, soils, every time they saw ground being plowed, harrowed, or seed sowed, they would remember, oh, I need to think, what kind of soil am I? Am I hard and beaten down? Am I rocky? Do I have thorns and thistles choking out the seed's ability to grow in my life? Or am I good soil? And then today we've looked at the parable of the mustard seed. And so every time they saw a mustard plant, don't you imagine they remembered, hey, that at one time was a little seed, but look at it now. And then think about, we were just Jesus, and then 12 disciples, and then it was a multitude. And on the day of Pentecost, 5,000 and 3,000, and then whole cities, and now a global church that millions of followers of Jesus Christ uh, bow to Him in prayer on a daily basis and read his words that their souls may be fed. So what started out so small is gonna end so strong. For Jesus is gonna come with the shout to the archangel and he's gonna come and we're gonna rule and reign the world together. So let me give you a closing example here. Very famous composer, many of you know uh, the name Beethoven. You may not know that Beethoven when he was in his 20s uh, was already going deaf. By the time he was 40, he was completely deaf. And so if you can imagine as a great composer having your music played but never being able to hear the applause at the conclusion of your music being played. And so finally one day somebody asked him, here you have been for 20 plus years composing music, continue to create new music for the world to enjoy and to listen to, yet you yourself cannot uh, benefit from your compositions. You can't hear them. 
uh, nor can you hear the praises or the applause of people that appreciate your gift and talent. Why in the world would you continue to do something that you can't benefit from? And I got to tell you, the answer that I read really riveted me when Beethoven said, I don't give my best based on how I feel or what I see, but I give my best based on what I believe it can become. I want you to know today that we may do things that we may never see the outcome from. We may never hear thank you or well done in this earth. Uh, we believe in Jesus Christ and we need to remember that the parable of the mustard seed is that we should not minimize our efforts or discount our abilities based on how insignificant it seems at the time, but we need to give our best in all situations and allow God to use us in all possible ways. You may never know the impact of giving to the homeless, teaching a Bible study to the lost, speaking a kind word to a broken spirit, or even granting forgiveness to someone, inviting them to a small group, or even investing them in other small ways. We should give our best based on what we believe it can become. Hear me today that uh, we are not insignificant. What seems like a small thing or insignificant, but in the hands of God can become a mighty force. And so we're excited about uh, growing in the kingdom. Now it's time for discussion and questions with your group. Uh, next week, we'll be looking at the parable of the tares. And until then, be blessed. Have a great small group. Thank you for listening. Till next time, go with God.